Welcome to West Fort Baptist Church online for Sunday, May the 23rd. We are pleased uh, to have you joining with us today, and we want to invite you to uh, join in with us on Zoom for a couple of opportunities to meet together with other believers through the week. Tuesday evening at seven o'clock, we have a very informal time of sharing together and uh, praying with one another. And then Thursday afternoon at two o'clock, we are doing a Bible study in the book of Titus. Uh, Daily Bread devotional booklets that begin on June the 1st are available from our mailbox, uh, 102 Glendale Crescent, so you can swing by and uh, help yourself there. And then with the reopening plan uh, that was announced here in the province of Ontario last week, if we are uh, reading it correctly, uh, we're looking forward to meeting for an outdoor worship service in the International Friendship Gardens on Father's Day, Sunday, June the 20th. But if we can meet sooner than that, then we will. And uh, we'll keep things updated on the answering machine at the church and also on our webpage and we'll let you know if you're on our email list as well. So we're looking forward to that. That'll be, that'll be great to be back together again. We are constantly making decisions, aren't we? Columbia researcher Sheena Ayengar has found that the average person makes about 70 decisions every day. That's 25,500 decisions that you and I make each year. For those of us who are serious followers of Jesus Christ, it's important for us to know what God's will is. Wouldn't it be great if there was a Finding God's Will app that you could, you know, you're faced with a question, uh, where should I go to school? What courses should I take? You just bring up your Finding God's Will app and it just uh, answers that question for you. Other questions that people wrestle with, what job should I get? Whom should I marry? Uh, should I get married? Uh, where should I live? All of those things, we, we seek after God's will. Now, Psalm 25 is a great passage in helping us get guidance because it is both a prayer asking for guidance, and so in that way, it serves as a model that we can follow, but it's also scripture that assures us of the certain hope of God's guidance in our lives. So let me read uh, that portion of God's word, Psalm 25, and I would welcome you to follow along as I read. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from old. Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant for the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then is the man who fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. He will spend his days in prosperity, and his descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have multiplied. 
Free me from my anguish. Look upon my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how my enemies have increased and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. Redeem Israel, O God, from all their troubles. And we thank the Lord uh, for his precious word. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you today with praise and thanks for answered prayer. There are those that we've been praying for with serious medical issues uh, that have received uh, surgical dates and others who are continuing on the path of treatment. And uh, so we just look to you, Father, uh, the great physician on behalf of those uh, who continue to need your help in that way. And Father, we thank you for answered prayer in light of the restrictions of the pandemic that we are in uh, being uh, eased in the very near future, looking forward to being back together for worship. And uh, so we thank you, Lord, and just pray for your continued guidance and help in the days ahead. Lord, we thank you uh, for those that we can partner with, some like uh, the Klusterhuses are looking forward to going back to Indonesia. And we pray for paperwork that they need uh, to have approved so that that can happen. Uh, for others who are on the field, like Rob and Catherine Fleming and their daughter Julia in Japan, that you would watch over them and protect them. For others who are working from home base, Lord, using the internet to coach and encourage and disciple those around the world like Ken and Marianne Jolly and uh, also Richard and Brenda Fleming and others. Father, we just uh, pray that you would strengthen their hands as they continue to serve you. We pray for those, Lord, in our own church family, uh, for kids who have been out of school and are struggling with uh, not being able to see their friends, uh, with uh, those who continue to work on the front lines. We think of uh, so many uh, in uh, retail uh, who are continuing to interact with people and, and are in a, a certain amount of risk in that position. So we, we thank you for them and pray for your blessing on them. For those in the medical field and those who are uh, shouldering the responsibility of, of guiding our city and province and uh, country uh, through these pandemic days that you would continue to, to grant them wisdom and grace, Lord. And uh, just help us all uh, to have hearts that are anchored in you, to trust in you, and to know that you are at work even in the midst of these trying days. Now we come, Lord, to the study of your word. We ask for the help of your Holy Spirit to understand and apply it to our lives so that we will grow in grace and in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. So this Psalm is just filled, and I, wanna, I want us to see that here before we get underway, uh, of David asking for and affirming God's guidance in our lives. So verse four, show me your Ways, O Lord, teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. Verse 8, God instructs sinners in his way. Uh, that's a good thing. Verse 9, he guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Verse 10, all the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful. And verse 12, God will instruct him in the way chosen for him indicating in verse 12 that each one of us has a path that is marked out by God. Your path is different than mine, so we can't look at one another as we, as we think about God's guidance and how he works in our lives, that, that he has you on a path that is marked out for you, and he has special things that he wants to accomplish in your life and in mine, and so our paths are going to be different, but we have here 
the example of asking for God's guidance and affirming the certainty that God is going to do that. Now, David is grappling with some big problems in his life. He's dealing with fear because he has enemies in verses 2 and 19. He is feeling the burden of his sin in verses 7, 8, 11, and 18, and asking God uh, to deal with that and the guilt that he is feeling. Uh, there's also loneliness and affliction that he mentions in verse 16. And then because he is asking for guidance, of course, we can, it's, it's just implied here that there's some uncertainty, that David doesn't know which way to go. He doesn't know what God wants him to do. And so he's asking for God's help. But the prayer that David prays and the instruction that he gives here are anchored in trusting in God, verses 1 to 3. So that's what starts off the psalm. And we need to understand uh, this uh, jumping off point in the first three verses. So David writes, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. So there's an expression of trust. As we saw last week, this uh, phrase, lift up my soul, is, is uh, saying to God, I trust you. Here, here is my soul. Here's the most important part of my life, and I am lifting that up. I am surrendering my soul to you. In you I trust, O oh my God. Do not let me be put to shame. Uh, don't let me be disappointed. disappointed. Don't, don't let me suffer the humiliation of just being out there on my own nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame or humiliated in that way, but they will be put to shame who are treacherous without excuse. So this uh, uh, affirmation of God's guidance uh, we find so often in the word of God. And this is one of the unique things about God. Of course, there is only one God, and then there's all the other things that people uh, make up themselves and uh, fashion idols and seek all kinds of other avenues of uh, guidance and instruction. Some people read their horoscope every day or they uh, read tea leaves or just all kinds of other things that people do. But here is David affirming the fact that when we seek God for guidance, then you are not going to be disappointed or humiliated, but God will answer that prayer. Listen to this, uh, af this really great affirmation that encourages our hearts from Isaiah 64, verses 4 and 5. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him, who trust in him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. So here's this uh, affirmation of God's, of God's guidance that we will never uh, be disappointed or ashamed when we put our trust in him. Now the Psalm here, it's, it's an acrostic that uh, where each verse here starts with a letter from the Hebrew alphabet. It's not exhaustive, uh, but uh, pretty much uh, the Hebrew alphabet is represented here uh, as you go through. Uh, the very best example, there are nine of these in the Psalms, but the very best example I'll show you from uh, Psalm 119 verse one, where if you have an NIV or a ESV, it'll, it'll uh, give you the Hebrew letter. And in Psalm 119, all eight verses of that first stanza begin with the Hebrew letter Aleph. And uh, so it just goes, goes through the whole Psalm 119, the longest passage in the Bible, is written that way as an acrostic using uh, the Hebrew alphabet. Now, why would uh, David do this? Well, there's a number of reasons, and, and James Montgomery Boyce, in his commentary, 
lays out three reasons uh, why some of the Psalms are written in this acrostic pattern. First of all, it adds uh, beauty and form uh, to the poem being written. Second, it gives a sense that the subject is being covered from A to Z. And thirdly, the acrostic pattern may be a device to encourage learning and memorization. I can remember uh, back in Bible school, we had uh, one of our professors who gave uh, fill in the blank uh, tests and exams. And so we would come up with these crazy acrostics, uh, stringing letters together to remind us of the words that went in the blank. So it can be uh, a helpful tool when it comes to memorizing something. Here in Psalm 25, we are going to look at four aspects of trusting God for guidance. Obedience, confession, fear, and prayer. So we see obedience in verses 4 and 5. Uh, or at least it's implied anyway. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior and my hope is in you all day long. So the idea here behind uh, calling this obedience is why would you even bother asking God to guide you uh, through a problem or an issue if you weren't ready to do what he says. It's like Jesus challenging the people of his day in Luke 6, verses 46 to 49, where he says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say? And then he goes on and he gives an illustration of what this looks like, both positive and negative. So for somebody who hears Jesus' words and puts them into practice, he is like a man who digs down and lays the foundation on a rock. And when the flood comes, uh, the storm uh, strikes the house, but it doesn't shake it because it was well built. But the person who hears the word, in other words, they, they see the guidance that we can receive from the word of God, but then they ignore it and do not put it into practice, is like a foolish man who just builds his house on the bare earth or sand without a foundation and then the storm comes along and the house collapse and its destruction is complete. So when we are saved by grace, the path forward in this relationship of walking with God is one step of obedience after another. Obedience becomes a lifestyle or a path that pleases God as we live in this world. Now think about your own relationships and friendships that you have, that you value. And, uh, you know, maybe there was an occasion where you met at a, at a function or a gathering or in school or whatever, and, and you've gotten to know one another over the years, and you know what pleases that friend of yours. And it's the same in when we start in a relationship with God and we experience uh, the transformation of being saved by grace. And as we walk with God, we know what pleases him. And we do that. We obey the word of God and walk with him in obedience. You and I need God to, uh, to teach us the way to go because our own built-in compass is faulty. Yes, we have a conscience, but it's, it's warped. It's... It, it just doesn't function the way that God intended it to do. Jeremiah expresses it this way, that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. It is even on, beyond our ability to understand how twisted and out of shape our hearts are before God. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says that there is a way that seems right to a man but in the end, it leads to death. And uh, boy, how that is true. When we look back over our lives at bad decisions that we've made where we thought we were on the right track, but it's really uh, taking us towards uh, disaster and trouble. Psalm 14 and verse uh, 3, one of these passages in the Bible that 
that puts the whole human race in the, whole cate- in a, in the same category. All have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And of course, we find that being repeated again. Paul reaches back to Psalm 14 uh, to uh, anchor that point in Romans chapter 3. Not only is our moral compass broken, but our perspective as human beings and even as followers of Jesus Christ, it's a limited perspective. Um, God says to his people through Isaiah in Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. The primary source for God's instruction is his word. Now, yes, God uh, prompts us or uh, brings someone to mind. I'm, I'm sure we've all had the experience of waking up in the middle of the night and thinking of somebody or having a burden on our hearts for somebody, so we pray for them. Maybe the next day we give them a call uh, to find out how they're doing and we, and we realize as we, as we connect and as we have a conversation that that was the leading of God in our lives to, to do that. So we don't find that in the Bible, you know, give uh, John Smith a call uh, this afternoon to see how he's doing. But the Bible is the primary source for knowing the heart of God, know what, knowing what pleases him and walking in obedience to him. The second thing we see in Psalm 25 as, as an aspect of finding uh, guidance from the Lord is confession. Here David reminds God of his mercy and love. He says in verse six, remember, O Lord, your great mercy or your compassionate compassions uh, would be one way of translating this literally. Uh, Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. So thinking about the track record that God has. And of course, we learn that when we pick up the word of God and we read the narrative of the Bible, how even in the Garden of Eden, God dealt mercifully with Adam and Eve, even after they sinned. And then all the characters of the Bible, uh, as you you follow God's dealings with them, there's a long history, a track record there of God's mercy and love in dealing uh, with broken, uh, straying, sinful, rebellious people. And, And God just continues to reach out in his love and his mercy. Then he follows that up by asking God, remember not the sins of my youth. Remember your mercy, but remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. I read a story this past week where Harry Ironside, uh, a uh, pastor in Chicago, was called to the bedside of a very old Christian man. He was in his 90s, and he had known the Lord for a long time. But as his life was coming to an end, he was telling people, everything seems so dark. So Pastor Ironside came to visit this man, and he said to him, you've known the Lord for nearly 70 years. You've lived for him a long time and you've helped so many other people spiritually. Whatever do you mean that these days are so dark? And the man replied, in my illness, since I have been lying here so weak, my memory keeps bringing up the sins of my youth and I cannot get them out of my mind. They keep crowding in upon me and I cannot help thinking of them. They make me feel miserable and wretched. So Pastor Ironside reads verse 7 of Psalm 25, Remember not the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you are good, O Lord. And after he read those words, he said, "When When you came to God 70 years ago, you confessed your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ. 
Do you remember what happened then? And the old man couldn't remember. Ironside said, Don't you remember that when you confessed your sins, God said, Your sins and iniquities I will remember no more? If God has forgotten them, why should you keep remembering them? The man relaxed. Uh, Pastor Ironside could just see a wave of peace come over that senior saint. And uh, the old man said, I am an old fool for remembering what God has forgotten. I like how George Horn, uh, who wrote a commentary on the Psalms, put it. He says, when God remembers his mercy, he forgets our sins. What a blessing it is to know that. Now, David, in verses 8 and 10, teaches about the character of God and the character of those who are going to receive God's guidance. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful for those who keep the demands of his covenant. Oh, there are probably some of you who need to hear these words because you're in the midst of trials and difficulties and, and uh, things that you're trying to sort out. And you need to hear the word of God today say that all the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful. That God has a plan in the midst of the path that he has marked out for you. So his character here that David says is good and upright, that he is faithful. He instructs sinners in his way and, and is faithful to uh, guide those who keep his covenant. In other words, we just keep trusting God every day, right? We trust him for salvation and we trust him for everything else that is taking place in our lives. David here, when he gets to verse 11, he wants his slate wiped clean. Nothing less than a full pardon will do. And so he says, uh, for the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. We tend to minimize our sin. We tend to come to God and say, forgive my sin, though, uh, though it could be easily overlooked because it's so small. What's the big deal, right? And not David. He's not going to play that game. He is going to admit that he is guilty of great sin. And of course, we're familiar with David's story, so we know what some of those things are. And we might think, well, you know, we're not as bad as that. But still, our sin is great. I'll, I'll show you that on the next slide. But this is really strange logic, isn't it? Uh, we can only imagine a criminal coming before a judge in court and saying, Your Honor, find me not guilty because my crimes have been many and the damage has been extensive. And you'd think, that doesn't make any sense at all. Why doesn't David try to minimize his guilt? But that's not the way that it works with God. When we confess our sins, instead of trying to cover them up or instead of trying to uh, minimize them, that is where the forgiveness of sins takes place, when we're just open and honest with God and we own up to the fact that we are sinners and, and um, that we need his mercy and forgiveness. Uh, so our sin is great. I think it's Spurgeon who wrote this. I wasn't able to find uh, the source, but it sounds like Spurgeon to me. Um, our sin is great when we consider against whom it is committed, that it is against a just and a fair law, that it is committed by those made in the image of God, and when we consider the amount of our sin. So God has a reputation here. Uh, notice that he says in uh, verse 11, as he's asking, as he's confessing his sin and asking for forgiveness, he says, for the sake of your name, O Lord, forgive my iniquity. So God has the reputation of his name to maintain. Let me just show you uh, 
how this connects, if I can get there, uh, to Exodus, I see I've got Exodus 33 on the slide, but it's actually Exodus 34, uh, verses five to seven. And so this is the situation where Moses says to the Lord, Lord, show me your glory. And God says, well, we'll have to do this carefully. I'll have to hide you in a safe place. And, and you can't see my face because no man can see my face and live, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you see a section of my glory. I'll let you see my back, in other words. And so listen to this in Exodus 34. Now listen to the connection here between the name and the reputation of God and what he does with sin. The Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with Moses and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. And then he goes on and he says he does not leave the guilty unpunished. So those who don't come to God and confess their sin, then he, he charges them with guilt. But those who are in a covenant relationship with him, who ask for God's forgiveness, God has the reputation of his name to maintain. And that is what David is counting on as he confesses his sin to the Lord. So David knew the freedom and peace that comes from saying, Lord, I know that I am a great sinner, but you are an even greater savior. Now, the reason that God can do this is because substitutionary atonement satisfies his justice. So the way that it worked in David's day, it's all by the grace of God. But because Jesus hadn't come yet, a person who was guilty of sin would bring a sacrifice to the Lord. The animal was innocent of human sin, and yet it would be sacrificed on behalf of the guilty person. And that acted out the grace and the payment that Jesus would make when he came. So the little lamb or the animal, the goat or the sheep or whatever, the bull or the ox that was being sacrificed was pointing forward to the finished work of Jesus Christ. But it was all based on God's grace. David wouldn't be earning his forgiveness by offering an animal. He was celebrating the grace of God that pointed forward to Jesus. But of course, on this side of the cross, we look back on the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. And I know we're looking forward to that day when we take the cup and we take the bread and we do this in remembrance of the finished work of Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and uh, the Passover lamb that has been sacrificed for us. Now in the next section, verses 12 to 15, we come across uh, this aspect of fear or reverence. Now this is a curious transition moving uh, from confession uh, to fear. And you see that just at the beginning there of uh, verse 12, where David says, who is the man that fears the Lord? He will instruct him in the way chosen for him. You'd think that fear would be the opposite emotion that you would feel in light of being forgiven of your sin. Many would use forgiveness as an excuse to continue to sin, right? If, God, if I come to God and confess my sin and he forgives, then why not do it again? And it's the very thing that Paul deals with at the end of Romans chapter 5, making the transition into Romans chapter 6, where he makes the statement that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And so he anticipates Christians asking the question, uh, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And uh, Paul responds, may it never be, or by no means, we died to sins in Christ. How can we live any longer in it? How could we disobey the Lord 
and do things that displease him when we are in a covenant relationship uh, with him through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of God's forgiveness makes us stand in awe of God because it's based on mercy. It's comforting and unsettling at the same time. So think of it this way. Think of, of having a huge debt hanging over your head like a mortgage, especially if you are buying a home in Toronto or Vancouver, where homes, are, you know, they're just sky high in price. So you go to the bank, you get a mortgage, you've got this thing hanging over your head and you're thinking, how is, how is, am I ever going to deal with this? And of course, the only way to deal with it is to just keep making those monthly payments, right? And so by the time you're 90, then you'll have your house paid off if, if that's the market that you buy into and you're just a regular person. Um, but you know, there's another way. Imagine receiving a letter from the bank or the credit union that holds that gigantic mortgage. And, and they're just informing you that they have forgiven your debt. They've just written it off. They've canceled your mortgage and you have no more payments to make. You think, wow, you would go around singing the praises of that bank and, and holding them in high regard and respect. See, it's the same thing that happens when we realize that we don't pay off our sins. We don't try to balance the scales. It's by mercy. And so in light of God's mercy, we stand in awe and reverence of a holy God who would forgive the likes of you and I. Look at the way that this, is, uh, this connection is made in Psalm 130, verses three and four. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. Therefore, you are feared or you are held in reverence or we stand in awe of who you are because of your mercy that forgives our sin. So David says here that God teaches those who fear him or those who stand in awe of him. And then he says remarkably in verse 14 that the Lord confides in those who fear him. Or, or I like the way that the ESV translates verse 14, that the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, that we are brought into the Lord's inner circle when we stand in awe of him after receiving his mercy. Apple CEO, uh, Tim Cook offered to have coffee for an hour with up to two people. The only catch was it would cost you $210,000. I don't know if it's worth that much money. But here, for those who, who have received God's mercy, the forgiveness of their sins, the response is a reverent fear of God, standing in awe of him. Spurgeon put it this way, those whose hearts are right shall not err for want of heavenly direction. Where God sanctifies the heart, he enlightens the head. Now we come to the last section, verses 16 to 21. And here David calls out again with just a specific requests that he piles on. I'm not going to read all these verses again, but I'm just going to pick out the requests here as he goes through verses 16 to 21. Turn to me, be gracious to me, free me from my anguish, look upon my affliction and distress, take away all my sins, guard my life, rescue me, let me not be put to shame. May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. So he keeps uh, crying out, to the Lord. This, uh, this need for guidance in David's life has not been resolved in this psalm. But because he trusts in God, because his request for help and guidance is anchored in faith 
that he has in God. He keeps uh, reaching out. He keeps on praying. He keeps on asking because he knows that God will come through. And then in the last verse, he, he prays for all of God's people. He realizes that this is true for all God's people, that we are all dealing with troubles of various kinds. As you're watching uh, this online uh, worship around the word this morning, there are troubles and problems that you are wrestling with in your own life. And, and so if there's a way that we can serve you by praying for you, please let us know. We need to pray for one another. And David does this at the end. He goes beyond his own situation and the, and the burdens and the problems that he's dealing with. And he realizes that this is true across the board, that all of God's people have problems and trials of various kinds. And so he asks God, redeem Israel out of all their troubles. So we need to pray for one another even as we pray for ourselves. The certain hope of God's guidance means that we will never know the shame or humiliation of being abandoned by God. You might look back over your life and see times when you have been greatly embarrassed where maybe friends or family have just, they've turned away from you and and, and they've just left you hanging and you are on your own and you've got nobody around. That will never happen when you trust in God. He is committed to those that he has redeemed through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not like, you know, we have an app on our phones a Finding God's Will for Our Lives app where we get turn-by-turn -turn instructions. You know, it's not going to happen that way, but it's, it's about the relationship that we have with God, that we trust Him implicitly. And uh, because He has redeemed us, that He is going to take care of everything else in our lives. How could God abandon those that He has redeemed through the saving work of Jesus Christ. If we trust in him, we will never be disappointed or ashamed. So if you have joined us online for this time around God's word and you don't know Jesus Christ, that is one thing that you can know for certain as you think about your future, that when your life comes to an end, that you will go to be with God not because you're good enough, but because you are a sinner. And when we confess our sins, God has a reputation to maintain in forgiving those who call upon his name. So do that and get that one big mystery cleared up in your life that you belong to God by faith in Jesus Christ who suffered in your place and paid off your debt of sin by his atoning work. And then as we walk with God, I just want to share with you in closing uh, words that Carolina Berg wrote in the hymn Day by Day. And I'm just lifting out here the, the second verse uh, to encourage our hearts as we close. Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me, he whose name is counselor and power. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As your days, your strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you have a great week. We close our time around God's word with this benediction from Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in God's love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ 
that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So be it. Amen.